Howdy folks! A little while ago, I stumbled across an old post in the Architecture subreddit that asked if the iconic T-shaped tower from Teen Titans was possible, like if it could be built. And the general agreement across the 50 or so comments seemed to be that yes, it could, but of course would have problems to solve due to its unique shape. So I wanted to use my background as a structural engineer and try and answer that more thoroughly, like what kind of problems would we have to solve, and how specifically might the design look? So, not just asking, can a T-shaped building be built, because, uh, spoiler alert, they have, but like, can this building be built? Using a design based on floor plans, coordinating with architectural features, floor-to-floor -floor heights, you know, doing the work. So, in order to answer that, we'll need to understand the architecture and programming to lay out the best places to embed the structural system so as not to impede function, architectural expression, the things that make it a building and not just a structure. But of course, all of that, in addition to making sure we don't compromise to the point that our structural system becomes infeasible. Oh, man. So then let's settle in and talk about the Teen Titan Tower. I actually think it's just called Titan Tower, which is nice to cut down on the tongue twister at least a little bit. And I'll say that there is a specific version of the tower that I wanted to analyze. Though I realize now I am unfortunately old enough, this isn't the most recent version of the Teen Titans show in the years since I was a kid, but given all the nostalgia I have for the 2003 Cartoon Network version of the Titan Tower, that was really the only option. Though after doing some light reading, I realized that this iteration is just one of many sweet concepts that the verse has created, with most of them converging on this same T-shape. So let's do a mini lore dump, a lore deposit if you will. The first Titan Tower appears in the 1980s comics focused on the Teen Titans in a pretty similar form to what we see in the O3 series, and is said to be located on an island somewhere near New York. As it goes with action series, the tower is destroyed by bad guys at some point and is rebuilt, and then by the third iteration, the tower is said to have moved to the west coast, and sure enough, here's San Francisco's Transamerica Tower peeking out of this panel. And there the tower will stay, uh, no matter the design, and importantly for us, uh, the O3 Teen Titans is set in a place called Jump City, which may as well be the Bay Area. And that's worth jotting down, as the location of the tower is going to hold some key design parameters, which we'll come back to. But there are many other designs that I thought looked really cool, so let's flip through those real quick. One here is clearly inspired by Frank Lloyd Wright's Falling Water, it even has the stream flowing underneath, that's one of my favorites. There's an Art Deco version, this ominous looking one with red windows, oh hey look, it got destroyed in this panel. <laughs> A modern version that's split into two towers at the base and covered in greenery. My headcanon for this is that with all the destruction the Teen Titans cause while pursuing enemies, they've tried to greenwash their architecture to increase public perception. Oh, and uh, watch your fingers, the plate on that sizzling take is still very hot. And uh, there's many more, uh, the cartoonish glass clad option of the Teen Titans Go, and then the forgettable live action version as well. Okay, so with all that, we come away with some sweet pictures, but importantly, a known location for the tower. Then what else can we rustle up? Well, an old comic panel gives a layout for the tower through the elevation view, but it's pretty clear that it's not the same tower as the O3 cartoon. But apparently hidden in a DVD set special features tab, a very 2000s sentence if I've ever heard one, were provided this view programming the levels throughout the tower. That will help us understand the architecture so we can plan out our structure. Awesome, so we see 10 stories above ground starting at the lobby, moving up through the evidence room to bedrooms, with some below grade functions like a warehouse and submarine launch. And the first thing I want to do is overrule where these below ground pieces are located. They'd be like right below the perimeter columns and just not well programmed with structure. So let's push these over a few feet to be outside of the building perimeter above. All right. So then even though it might not be quite exact, I do want to use this layout to define the floor to floor heights, which vary wildly from the cavernous lobby at the ground floor to the tight corridor up high. But how tall is the tower overall? Well, according to those old comics, the Titan Tower rises to 300 feet or 90 meters, which is kind of nuts. Uh, most high rises could fit 20 to 30 stories within that same height. And so not only do these five dorks have a whole tower to themselves, they have a lot of headroom. Still, I'm happy to port over that height for our case and then scale out the floor to floor heights based on that dimension. And if so, that lobby would be over 80 feet tall, absolutely huge for a first story. 
As for the base, we'd have a 100 foot wide square to support a T that's 300 foot wide at the top. Sweet, so that gives us a decent idea on the general layout and would be easy enough to draw a grid out of columns and beams based on these dimensions. But uh, first we've got a few considerations to take into account. Uh, we're all familiar with the main room that the Titans hang out in, the layout calls this the Ops Room, and something notable about this is that it doesn't have any columns interrupting the space, so let's take that at face value and leave that as a column-free space. And of course it has these huge open windows which we'll want to respect by not putting any bracing elements crossing through their view, but then where do we have the ability to place some structure? Now, so as not to reinvent the wheel, let's look at some of those T-shaped buildings mentioned before for, um, inspiration. So the most on-the-nose example is the Cruceta de la Vigia on the island of Puerto Rico. That one uses a cast-in-place concrete framing to create a central tube, rising about 100 feet or 30 meters up the middle, with some concrete-walled, tapering, cantilevering arms, which are just likely a single story, and I will say it's nice enough that they used exposed structure to help us see what they did, even if the scale is about one-third of what we're trying to achieve with Titan Tower, but at least there's some good proof of concept. Another example isn't quite a T-shape, but rather is the CCTV Tower in China, which occupies this odd, bent square shape, but though, to be more precise, uh, it's actually described by this sliver of a very tall pyramid. Go figure. The CCTV tower probably demonstrates this style of architecture near its pinnacle. For scale, it's over 700 feet tall with two towers that have an approximately 150 foot square plan dimension. And I think the key takeaway from this building is the use of the external diagrid, or basically these steel trusses that zigzag all around the perimeter of the building, to the point that they are ostensibly defining the architectural expression of the facade. These diagonally oriented steel members provide both vertical and lateral support, which is going to be really helpful since there is going to be heavy lateral forces induced just by the weight of the system, and that's before we even think about wind or earthquakes. And there were some other notable buildings that opted for this kind of form, like the Singtel Tower in Singapore or the Cruz del Tercer Milenio in Chile. Now, armed with that info, let's head back to Titan Tower to start laying out some columns and shear walls. We'll likely be able to locate some columns at a regular grid spacing of 20 to 30 feet, and let's say we use the side faces of the building to act as our lateral system, which is pretty similar to the Cruceta del Vigia. With the exception of these windows going up about half the height that we could leave open, and that should be plenty deep for some stout structural walls to resist the lateral force of the wind, and I'm sure that will be significant since the T will act like a big billboard face, so that's one direction to solve for the lateral loads, but how about the other? It might not have the same billboard face taking all that wind, but it would still want to have a decent system. Though, unlike the north-south direction, we have those big, beautiful glass walls that I'm sure an architect would like us to preserve and not cover up with structure, so no concrete walls there. Then this is where I'll take a bit of liberty with assuming more about the floor plan. We'll want to have an elevator, of course, even if Starfire and Beast Boy can just fly down. Similarly, we'll want to have a home for a staircase, and I'm electing to place the floor openings for these systems somewhere near the middle. That still allows for the full height glass walls on the north and south faces. So then it feels reasonable to place a shear wall along one of these middle grids and punch some openings in for hallways so that you can get off the elevator and go to the gym. Now, is this floor plan the most efficient for space? Probably not, but reminder that I am an engineer, not an architect. Anyways, uh, that seems to lay out a decent concept for the core of the tower, but how about the actual interesting part, the, the T? Well, the general load transfer will have floor loads and the weight of structure pulling down with a tension cord pulling back up to the top of the tower, so let's apply some steel trusses that can take out these diagonal loads in the most direct path back to the big core walls we just drew. And for this, we'll want to use that CCTV tower example from earlier to help us at least consider how we'll put in some steel members, though due to the long span and significant width, it's going to be necessary to have these diagonals applied not just at the perimeter, but probably also within the hallways. Hopefully these can be coordinated to fall within the interior partitions, or at least be used with an architectural sense like they were for the Chinese tower. Alright, so now is a good time to switch the conversation over to a bit more of an analytical one using the very powerful structural design tool called eTabs to aid in the modeling and design process. 
which I'll show you if you show me your support by liking the video and subscribing. Or if you waited five seconds and uh, didn't do those things. Anyways, here's our first iteration for the structural design of the Titan Tower. So, since lines on a computer screen probably don't mean too much to you, or really even me for that matter, I'll start by saying that the floor framing is pretty typical. I've used a composite concrete slab on metal deck system for the flooring, supported by a steel framework of beams and columns, which was selected due to its relatively light weight, while also being somewhat lore accurate. Uh, the few times we do see some structure shown for the tower, we get a glimpse of these eye-shaped beams. Not that I need to take the animated structure that seriously? Like, when a hole is blasted in the tower, we see some steel, probably where it shouldn't be, not to mention, this T should probably start falling down in what's known as a progressive collapse. But then again, that really wasn't the interesting part. Uh, the diagonal trusses picking up the floors of that T-shape did require some steel members that were quite large. The ones at the perimeter that only supported the tip were reasonably sized, but closer to the center, we needed I-beams that weigh over 200 pounds per foot. Another bit of unorthodoxy was seen at the lowest level, since we were gifted with the 80 foot tall lobby on the first floor, and the issue with that is the strength of the columns generally reduces by the square of the length, making these not 7 times weaker than a typical column, but 50 times weaker. Now put a 225 foot tall building on top of that. So I was finding that even the largest steel size in the catalog only worked for an exterior condition where the loads were lighter, and for the interior we'd likely need a composite steel and concrete hybrid column. And so those elements are the critical parts of the gravity load or dead weight design. Next we'll look at applying lateral loads or wind forces. The general rules of thumb could work like applying 20 or 30 pounds per square foot across the whole face of the building, but I'm an unfortunately serious person when it comes to cartoon architecture, and we'll be applying the strictest interpretation of the building code, for which that bay area or location we figured out before will be pretty handy, or at least it means we can apply precise factors to the equation, like peak wind speed, which is geographic in nature. But we'll need to modify that by some local factors based on the fact that the tower sits on an island in the middle of the bay, so no obstructions to baffle the wind, that'll penalize us. Sitting on top of that local high point, the island, well that'll speed up the wind as well. And for that we'll apply a topographic factor. And it'll push the building in a few different patterns uh, along the primary directions, but we'll also try and twist the building, and this is where our wall layout will punish us a little bit. Because structurally speaking, the classic I-beam shape which we happened to provide for our shear wall system is pretty bad when it comes to twisting, whereas a box or circle shape is much better at resisting torsional forces. However, given all the purchase I've afforded the structure with these huge walls, we're in pretty safe territory and the deflections we see at the top are on the order of magnitude of just a few inches. Good design will typically want to limit the movement at the top of the building to be at most 0.2% of the overall height, which for us means about 7 inches, really not much movement, though this is kind of an arbitrary limit assuming that the facade materials will start to observe distress once that much movement is seen, but another limit we might want to observe would be the maximum felt accelerations, because people don't, uh, they don't notice movements, we notice change in movements, uh, thanks to our inner ear, and that's a bit of next level analysis, which if I hear folks in the comments, I'll be sure to address in future videos. All in all, the result of the lateral design would be providing some moderately reinforced uh, two foot thick shear walls, which is nothing too crazy even if they are 100 feet long, <laughs> which is a lot. Okay, so if you've been twiddling your thumbs this whole time since I mentioned the Bay Area thinking, well, this is all well and good, when are we getting to the real stuff? Well, here we go. Earthquakes. Small ones, but they're happening all over the city. No, 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 no. Big ones. Uh, San Francisco uh, not only is susceptible to earthquakes, but the soils typically found there are scientifically speaking uh, crap. Uh, very bad. Complicating the design even further is that so much of the weight of the structure is up high on the building in the T-shape, and like I said, using 200 pounds per foot diagonal braces, I realize now that I didn't give you context, but the floor I-beams will weigh about 10% of that. And the reason why it's consequential to have all that weight up there is that earthquakes affect buildings in somewhat specific ways that we can design for. When the earth rumbles below, it's shifting up, down, side to side, in directions with quantifiable accelerations. And when the building moves at the base, well, the rest of the structure is dragged along with it in succession. And the force that this movement generates is lateral in nature and generally proportional to the weight of the floor itself. 
So then, based on collected data for movement during past earthquakes, we can apply these horizontal accelerations on our building, meaning we can design the building to resist an earthquake of intensity that the geographic location warrants. So if we take a building in California's Bay Area that has a geometry of this sort, some quick calculations show that we might expect the horizontal earthquake demand on Titan Tower to be 5 or even 10 times the total weight of the building, compared to wind which would only be about 5% of the building weight, so like 100 times more dangerous. And this started to make a bit of sense to me, only because as I ran the model importing these loads of 10 to 40 million pounds at each level, the results were out of the ordinary, to say the least, with expected deflections of 10 to 20 feet depending on the mode shape. And here's where I uh, started to struggle. I revised my original design that worked so well for wind loading and thickened up the perimeter walls, which that didn't do a whole lot to help, but as the more structural weight was added, the larger the inertial forces were, causing too much tail chasing. So changing those big concrete walls to something like a series of steel X braces might be a better solution as they'd weigh a little less, and analytically this seems to help a bit, but still would need a more refined analysis for each of the hundreds of members. Look, I'm not paid hourly for this, but I can say that some help could come in the form of a buckling restrained brace, which would yield under earthquake motion and help dissipate the energy safely at the expense of having a deformed building, with the primary goal being that the Titans would be able to get out of the tower safely. Though it is worth noting that there are many buildings, especially in the northwest United States and British Columbia, that utilize a comparable form which has more mass higher up the skyscraper and tapering down to the base, something rather counterintuitive. And as I understand it, having a less rigid connection to the ground while allowing for larger movements reduces the forces applied to the structure and can actually increase safety. Now, if it wasn't obvious in my nine years of engineering practice, I really haven't had to design too many buildings that we would have expected to experience a significant earthquake. For the most part, my projects have been in flat old Texas, and our primary threats aren't as problematic for building safety as they are for public safety. Morbid quips aside, that is a decent segue to the final point that the Titan's tower is prone to attacks meaning there may need to be some level of blast resistance incorporated into the Titan Tower in the same way that many federal buildings are now designed with terrorist attacks in mind. I mean, the bad guys are all kind of terrorists, right? No. Actually, don't, don't answer that. Uh, let's keep the comment section clean. But a study would need to be done to evaluate the threat level and what measures could be taken to reduce any impact an attack would have, though maybe being centered in a large body of water reduces the need for these provisions. All right, so then to summarize the design, uh, we'll want to coordinate strong shear walls on the east and west faces where the architectural expression isn't compromised, additionally providing tall floor-to-floor -floor heights and column-free spaces in some areas, framed with sometimes modest and sometimes quite heavy structural steel sections. Recall it did seem necessary to apply composite steel and concrete columns uh, down low, Next, the cantilevers of the T-shape were supported by a heavy network of diagonal braces to carry that load back to the core walls, and while we may experience some decent movement in the wind, it doesn't appear to be too perceptible for our very lucky Teen Titans. And if this project were in a low seismic region, I'd feel super comfortable giving it a go, but in the location it's supposed to be, I'm not so sure about that. I'm not saying it's impossible, as the CCTV tower was also built with significant earthquakes in mind, but if I were to improve the design of the tower, I'd probably try to sneak more structure across the ops room by lowering the story height here in addition to lowering the lobby height to help those 80 foot tall columns and potentially letting structural braces cross behind the exterior windows on both faces. I mean, that would certainly help, but we'd have to see what the architect has to say about that. Anyway, so thanks for watching the video. Comment your thoughts or any suggestions down below, and I'll see you in the next one. Adios.